Hi, this is Lex, and welcome to the Fintech Blueprint. It's your podcast about fintech, decentralized finance, digital banking, investing, robo-advice, artificial intelligence, and all the other frontier technology that is transforming financial services. To get more content, like an illustrated transcript of this conversation in your inbox, subscribe at fintechblueprint.com. So without further delay, let's jump into today's episode. Hi, everybody, and welcome to today's conversation. I'm really excited today to welcome Mark Aubrey, who is the chief executive officer of Cathion Gaming, a really fascinating blockchain-based gaming and entertainment company. We're going to talk about the evolution of the gaming sector and, and especially the evolution of the Web3 gaming sector, but we'll also learn a ton about the more traditional entertainment industry and how to think about virtual worlds and how to think about communities. With that, Mark, welcome to the podcast. Thanks, Lex. It's a real pleasure to be here. Thanks for having me. My pleasure. I've been really looking forward to this conversation because there's so much I'm excited to learn. Let's start at the beginning of your professional journey and the foundational experiences that you've had in the beginning of your career that kind of formed how you think. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, look, I I I was always quite, you know, drawn to sort of ana- strong analytics and strong commercial kind of backgrounds and 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 I think when I first entered the video games business about you know 20 years ago it was still relatively nascent at 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 that point it was growing but it looked nothing like the kind of you know behemoth that you see now where video games is you know pretty much bigger than all other forms of entertainment combined but you know I could see the strong growth and the strong potential that, that that gaming had so you know I was a I had a marketing background I was very keen you know, I didn't at the time even really know uh, roles existed in the video games industry, but I was lucky enough to get a role uh, with Activision and managed multiple of their of their key franchises on on PC and and console. That led to carving out a career, you know, over the next twenty years. You know, from marketing with Activision, you know, working on Lucas Arts. You know, I was working on Star Wars and and Indiana Jones games, which was which was unbelievable. And then was one of Warner Brothers' very early video games employees, you know, in about 2008 when they decided to enter the video game space, you know, they made some really big investments into that. And I was one of their first international employees that helped sort of build and craft out that strategy for, for Warner Brothers Games Division. You know, I took a bit of a pivot and spent a couple of years in, in casino gaming, which was the same but slightly different, you know. And then, and then you know, the last seven and a half years I've been at Activision Blizzard, running Activision Publishing and Blizzard Entertainment's, you know, go to market and commercial operations. You know, thinking about communities of players, you know, across the region. You know, I was in, I, I oversaw the Asia Pacific organization, so all of our teams uh, across Asia, you know, huge communities of players across some of the biggest franchises in in entertainment and in and in video games. And so through that, you know, it was a it was a huge learning experience for me, both as a as a marketeer and later as a as a sort of more general manager, managing director. And, you know, I think now looking towards Web3 and blockchain gaming and, and you know, this exciting new world, you know, it was a, it was, I was really excited to take on this challenge as I really think this is a massive evolution or the next major evolution for, for, for the video game space. That's fascinating stuff. I want to start us really, really narrow and then kind of build up to the portfolio or the global level, sort of similar to the trajectory of your career. I want to start with just a very naive question to get our definitions, which is, in your view, what is a video game? You know, And when you were just joining the industry for the first time, you were excited about it. In your mind, like, can you describe... What is a video game? What is the purpose of it? Who is it for? You know, how is it made? Yeah, I think if I if I could put that into its most narrow form, it's of course entertainment. So it it, it has to be fun. But I believe probably the interactive nature of video games, probably the word that comes to mind for me is escapism. And so it's the ability to, through uh, entertainment medium, escape into a new world. And whether that's a 
fantasy oriented world or whether it's the cockpit of a f1 fighter or a formula one racing car or it's putting you on the pitch at Wembley playing uh, for the FA Cup in a, in a soccer game. That in its essence is what gaming in its purest form. And when I first started, first entered the industry, it was more single player oriented. But I think in its purest form, that's sort of, that's what it was. And then it evolved into something way bigger. And I won't, yeah, that it, it became more community oriented and social oriented. So it has come on massively since then. But I think in its purest form, Escape, escapism and entertainment is what comes to mind for me. I'm tempted to kind of double click on just what those words mean. And, you know, what does it mean for somebody to escape or to be entertained? You know, what's the difference between escaping into a virtual experience versus into a physical experience and kind of like the distinction between those? I'm worried that's almost too abstract. In my mind, I'm connecting that to the idea of like a game designer, like of somebody designing that experience. Is that a distinction that's useful? I, I think it is. And and look, and I don't think it's massively dissimilar to other forms of entertainment if you think about, you know, the, the escapism for a couple of hours that that you get when you sit down and watch a watch a film. I think it's much more complex in, in many regards. No disrespect to any other mediums, but I think when a game designer sits down to develop a ga- the game, they really need to be thinking about the interactive, you know, nature of that environment. And, you know, the having spent years working with studios and animators and game designers and developers, you know, what they do is extraordinary. You know, the worlds they build and 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 the art that they create, and it really is art, is true escapism from the character development to the storytelling to, but they have to do it in a way that puts the player center to the pro center to the storyline, center to the experience. And it's incredible. I, you know, I, I worked more, you know, on the publishing side of the business and I was constantly in, in awe of the incredible art that, the, you know, game designers and game developers create in developing these worlds and thinking about story arcs and thinking about interactivity and, and, and battles and how they really immerse players in that experience in a single player campaign, but even more extraordinarily when you think about multiple human players in that environment. And it's incredible. It definitely is. And I think that the evolution of the genre has been really interesting because maybe 40 years ago, you could sort of lob this criticism of video games being toys because they couldn't render very much or because they were transparent in the way that they worked or because they were for points. You know, it was very much sort of a a childhood bracket around it. But as the generations that had that as part of their childhood became economically productive and mature and so on, it feels to me that the genre has turned into like simulations or renderings of narrative experience. And so I think that people can have much more real, much more profound experiences within these virtual environments and within the rule sets of these virtual environments that make them feel you know, more fulfilled or actualized, like reaching their potential in a way. And those feelings are more real than many that they encounter in the physical world. I mean, have you seen a similar type of trajectory or am I projecting? No, I I think you're one hundred percent spot on. I think the the sense of achievement, you know, the sense of you know complex problem solving that 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 you achieve, you know, you're in this you're in this virtual world or or you're in this environment that you know is is for all intensive purposes it it is it is it's entertaining and that it's fun, but you are you know you're being challenged in multiple different ways. You know, you're being asked to think about things uh, differently, and the sense of achievement, the emotional attachment, you know, the emotional attachment that you get to the the characters elicits you know all sorts of emotions, and I think. That is the beauty of, of, of video games and it's, you know, it's, it's been incredible, you know, over 20 years to see how much they've evolved. I mean, it was a constant battle, you know, very early on in the industry. It was very much seen as though it was, it was kids' play, yet, you know, internally in the industry we knew the average age of a gamer was actually over 30. Now it's more like over 40 and it's gender neutral, you know, it's equally male, equally female and, you know, some of our some of the games that get created, the biggest audiences are females 40, 45, 50 plus. So it's, you know, it's incredible to see how the whole ecosystem has evolved. But, you know, I think those experiences, as you say, are are richer for the fact that 
you're creating emotional attachments, you're solving complex problems, you're, you know, you're working through, you have to work hard to achieve the outcome at the end of that. And I think that's an incredibly rewarding experience for the person going through it. Let's talk about the business of publishing and your role of running a portfolio of various titles. Can you flesh that out a bit? Like, what was that like? And how did you think about maybe the economics of it or what it meant to grow it? You know, like from a business perspective, what was your experience? Over the years, it, it, it changed a lot as, as video games changed because, you know, in the early days, it was all about how many boxes you sold, right? You, you would release a game, it would sell for 60 bucks US, you know, equivalent all over the world. And you measured success based on how many boxes went out the door. And, you know, our job was to, you know, market and publish and build sort of go to market plans that would, you know, create hype and buzz and excitement for, for, for those games. Over time, the, the model shifted and, and, and that shifted with the growth of mobile gaming, the growth of free-to-play gaming, the go- growth of massive online communities. And it almost got to the point, particularly for really big publishers, it almost got to the point where you were less competing with other, other titles and more, you know, you were looking internally at your own ecosystem, your own community of players. And you were thinking, you know, the commercial model or the success of that commercial model was built based on, you know, the number of players you had and could, you know, retain in your, in your ecosystem. So, you know, you would have, you know, the, the role was then more around new user acquisition and retention and, and win back and, and limiting churn. And what was interesting about that was, you know, that you you had to do that by creating really strong, compelling gameplay, but doing that on an ongoing basis. So that's where the whole concept of live operations or ongoing content within the gaming sort of ecosystem, you know, meant that games became 24-7, 365 days a year. And, you know, the the game, if you did launch a, a premium game at all, just became the start of the process of something that really became what became term, you know, the term was games as a service. And you, you were, you know, you were managing that game as an ongoing live service to a community of players that you did your best to keep entertained and engaged in your product. Otherwise they moved on to, they moved on to something else. It's challenging and it's competitive, but the big games that do it well, you know, it's incredibly rewarding, but I think that's, and, you know, we, we will get onto it. I think that's when you start to look towards Web3 and, and blockchain gaming. I think that's where it gets interesting because if I look at the dark side of that, you know, the the growth of free-to-play and the growth of mobile gaming has, you know, in some regards created models that, you know, were always about, okay, well, how do we continue to monetize this audience? How do we continue to build build revenue, which you need to do. You're spending a fortune on developing and, and, and developing these games, but it led to, you know, it also led to a monetization loop that needed to be attached to that. So yeah, it's but launching a video game today and keeping it ongoing in a live environment is a pretty, it's a, it's a very challenging thing to do, particularly for a successful game. Yeah. And I think, you know, just to wrap additional context around that, that this transition happened in the gaming industry, but it also happened in the software industry more broadly, right? So if you look at selling copies of Windows and Microsoft Office to instead getting people into an ongoing subscription for 10 bucks a month to, you know, storage and office, and you look at the same with Photoshop and so on. So software got repackaged that way. And actually, a lot of business got repackaged that way. You know, startups are built on cumulative recurring revenue as part of a venture capital funding model. And the whole world went to subscription and shifted into something that is incentivized to get people to continue paying and kind of be in this addictive stream of engagement. Can you share any of the kind of the scale of these more popular games that you had covered either in the earlier days or in the last few years when you were managing at a very senior level. Can you talk about sort of the size of some of these communities and then how you think about individual consumers? Some of these communities are, they're in the the, the tens of millions of, of players. And, you know, and, and the way that you would serve that that community, you know, I think 
you know, at the, at the, I, I can't remember the exact, the exact number, but at the time I left Activision Blizzard, I believe across their portfolio, they had something like 400 million monthly average users there or thereabouts across their, across their portfolio of games. So it's an enormous audience of, of players. And depending on what game they were in, whether it was Call of Duty or World of Warcraft or Overwatch or Candy Crush or whatever, you know, you had very different tactics and, and very different approaches to, to those audiences but you're you know you're dealing with and and you know that's just within activision blizzard's portfolio if i look to roblox if i look to fortnite if i look to league of legends you're dealing with audiences that are in the tens if not hundreds of millions of players worldwide these are enormous audiences huge within the industry what is a good metric for a paying customer per year like what is an expected benchmark for monetization of this type of audience it is very, very different ver- by game. So, I mean, the metric would be something like average revenue per user or average revenue per paying user would be, you know, but even you might look at monthly average users, you know, depending on depending on the game, you know, there's multiple metrics that you could look that would gauge the, the success of, of that game and it differs wildly. You know, there isn't a single kind of metric by, by genre or by game, but there's multiple metrics within live game environments that, that that game companies would look at on a regular basis to measure the success and health of their of of their product. I bring this up because, you know, we talk about and think about financial services quite a bit with our audience and there's always this refrain about getting access to financial services, getting access to some particular product that enables you to, you know, if you have access to lending for example, you're able to buy something that you need or build something that you need. There's been this trend of similarly creating these subscription flows that get people kind of plugged in and engaged into various ecosystems with capital in them. And to me, like the entertainment experience has gotten around to a really similar place, which is why we'll get into, you know, Cathion and blockchain and metaverse stuff. It's gotten to a similar place, into a similar shape, which is these aren't games in the sense that you are, you know, you want to put a quarter into a machine and make a ball go around. You're paying like access to a particular emotional state and maybe even set of social connections, you know, and you are often doing kind of almost productive activity there, right? Like World of Warcraft has an economy. World of Warcraft has economic output or at least some sort of macroeconomics. How do you think about the economics within traditional games, like the gold farming that would go on and, you know, like item exchanges and stuff like that? Yeah, particularly for a game like a, like a massive multiplayer role-playing game, you know, they're, they're incredibly complex in-game economies. You will have a you know in ca- in game economist that basically will be responsible for building you know building out that economy and and assuring you know how it works and that it's all balanced and 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 everything within it no no differently to the way it would be built out in in real world economy so I mean they're they're incredibly complex and they have enabled people outside the game the game ecosystem you know with WoW you know that you mentioned you have people that were having people farm gold for them in Vietnam or in another in another sort of world to sort of stop take that grind out and then sell that outside of the game ecosystem so yeah there it's it's an incredibly complex environment and the more games have become service oriented that in-game economy or an in-game currency that that sits within game has become pretty much the norm across all genres all sorts of games if we move towards Web3 and blockchain, right? you've established a pretty prolific career in some of the best brands in the entertainment world. And yet, here you are a few months ago, you've joined Cathion Gaming as the CEO. Can you tell us about, first, just your experience of observing and thinking about Web3 before you pulled the trigger and kind of what kinds of symptoms and evidence that you were noticing that led you towards this industry and pulled you in? I think there was a couple of things for me and and the the first ones were actually broader than broader than gaming and but then were tied to ended up being tied to 
tied to gaming. And and that was just, you know, the the whole idea of, you know, a more decentralized internet and, you know, the the game changing sort of shift that web three will create to our lives holistically, you know, is enormous. And, you know, watching sort of the growth of decentralized finance and, and, you know, a lot of the, you know, a lot of the different crypto apps and wallets and, you know, transactions that were happening in that space. And, 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 you know, it was evolving so quickly and, you know, and then you tie in elements of the metaverse and, and what that would look like. And, you know, this concept of, you know, the uh, of virtual worlds that exist in this environment. And then, you know, when you, I started to sort of see the early games that were coming into this space. And, you know, with a lot of technology, gaming has quite often been uh, the Trojan horse of mass adoption of, of a, shift in, a shift in technology. And when I saw a lot of the, the very early games, you know, you could see that they weren't going to be, you know, what the future of this looked like. You know, that the, the, there were probably more DeFi-oriented games that had some level of gamification that sat at the back of them. So the kind of earn mechanics or the DeFi mechanics sat up front and then there was sort of some element of game behind that. But I could sort of start to see, particularly, you know, with the types of products that, that I worked on with these huge engaged communities, you could see a world whereby when the entertainment value started to come more to the fore and the earn mechanics started to become more secondary benefits of what was already a very fun and engaging experience, then and you then understood the benefits of smart contracts enabled by the blockchain underneath that and what that could unlock, I, I could see a world where this was just going to be absolutely game-changing within the video games business. And, and you know, where, what I, why I believe that is that, you know, game communities are now the absolute lifeblood of a, of a successful game. You know, there, there is no game without a successful, thriving community of players and not only do that do those communities of players spend hours of their own time and put loads of their own money into those experiences, but video game companies use those communities to even actively market the game. You'll use influencers, you'll use ambassadors from the community, you know, you'll run tournaments, you will use professional athletes that play the game in esports ecosystems. So the communities aren't just the lifeblood, they're now an active part of what makes a AAA game successful and give it longevity. So this concept of creating a more circular economy that in some way creates utility or reward for the community that recognises the role that they play within that ecosystem, either as a player of the game or whether that's through user-generated content or through another means of, of how they contribute to that ecosystem, that's game-changing in the video games industry. And when you've, you know, so that, that I guess a long-winded way of saying, you know, they were the things where if I, if I look at that and I look at that done well and I look at the evolution of this space, I just think it's bound to be a huge evolution of, of the game space. And that's essentially what brought me into there's a very eloquent framing of all the things that are pushing Web3 forward. And I have a question around it, which is, you know, if you look at some historic analogies, when Napster came out, the traditional music labels hated it. And, you know, Metallica famously tried to sue a bunch of teenagers for pirating their music. You know, with Bitcoin and crypto going online and being available you know as early as 2000 2009 and and then really exploding in usage through the 2010s the financial industry did as much as possible to not acknowledge or recognize or be interested in any of the profound transformations underneath the branding and the the packaging of what they thought crypto was now that blockchain based gaming and the nft sort of wave is hitting the entertainment industry pretty profoundly, there's similar pushback, similar in the sense of people that are used to how stuff is and that like how stuff is really don't want to consider another model and are often really allergic to it. And it's been very surprising to me because a large portion of the gamer community 
people who love these virtual experiences who maybe have not been crypto native and and have not needed to deal with it in their life or even think about it have really struggled to accept or invite in the fact that you can have web3 features and that they could enhance their experience and create new opportunities and kind of supercharge user generated content and creativity why do you think there's this tension by you know gamers who want blockchain and NFTs, and then gamers who think that it should be kept out of their experience? Yeah, I, I think it's, a, I think it's a, a great question. And I think the analogies you drew are, are, are perfect, you know, because if your business model is predicated on selling CDs that have got, you know, 13 tracks on them, you know, from, from Metallica and, you know, Spotify comes out and says, hey, you know, just stream this music for free. It fundamentally disrupts the, 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 the business model. And you, you're seeing the same thing here. So you know, I'll answer the question in, in two sides. So I think from a core publisher side, you know, if I, I think publishers are watching the space, but when you 100% control the in-game economies and the f- whole flow of revenue from the business is one way. There's no immediate desire from 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 a publishing perspective or a development perspective to go, hey, yeah, look, let's go and share elements of our of our of our ecosystem and and share this with with communities of players and provide some level of utility back. So it's natural there that there's going to be a bit of a wait and see approach. I think on the on the player side. A lot of education is required to the benefit, because, and but I don't blame player communities because they, you know they, if if we're being honest, they've they've been they've been burned. You know, modern free to play mechanics that sit in the game, kind of you know you join, you play, you come into a game for free, you play the game, you're consistently being provided with new content. That new content consistently requires you to spend more money in the game. And, you know, you eventually get to the game, get to a point in a lot of these games where more often than not, they're pay to win. You know, you you have to, you're either going to have to invest loads of time to get through or you're going to have to, and, and you know, development teams need to get paid. So, you know, there's the gamers have become very skeptical. So I think, you know, at the, you know, the start of then saying, hey, here's these NFTs, here's these digital assets or these things that you can buy in the game. I think it's a very natural reaction for gamers to just say, hey, this is just another way to monetize us and it's another way to kind of pull money out of the pockets. And and that's led to, to skepticism and the video games companies have certainly got no reason to say, you know, oh, no, this is actually a good thing. I think once you start understanding the benefits and once you start talking about the ability to have true ownership, thinking about interoperability, you know, and the way that could z- exist inside some games, even outside, you know, blurring the lines between physical and, and real world. And if you think about true the true ability to own an asset that you can buy, sell and trade in games. So if you don't want to play a game anymore, you get something back for the contribution and the hours and the money that you've put into the game by trading those those assets. And then when you think about the whole world of user-generated content, you know, some of the biggest games in the world have been built out of modifications to, to games. So, so if you think about open, potentially open source ecosystems that allow user-generated content and if that user-generated content becomes successful, then the community that developed it or the player that developed it and the developer, they both benefit from that and via the smart contracts can both share in that success. From a developer, you could even think of alternate ways to source funding for a game. I mean, there's, there's, multiple, there's multiple benefits, but as it stands today, and I think some of this is tied to what the very early product looks like, which is still very earn forward and not entertainment forward, the true benefits of what this could look like and how it could evolve aren't necessarily that well understood yet. But over time, I believe they they will be, and that will lead to a greater acceptance of what blockchain, you know, gaming offers. Just like all the examples that that you provided, when people under, better understood those business models as well. It's a very profound fundamental transformation at the level of tools available for creatives, whether they are commercially minded or whether they are, you know, just artistically minded. And it's just a matter of those tools going through iterations and iterations until people realize 
how much more interesting or engaging or better their experience could be from these games. Which takes me to Cathion. And I know we've taken a windy road here, which I appreciate because I think we've opened up a lot of important and interesting stuff. Let's talk about Cathion and let's talk about you know its portfolio and position, right? So there's over 20 games that have been built including on Solana, there's millions of community members, there's lots and lots of downloads across all the different games that you have in place. Can you talk a little bit about what is in that portfolio? Like what are some of the titles that have done well and maybe anything that you notice that you think people like? We have a couple of our, our own games as well, which are 100% owned IP. So, you know, that we're developing Soul Chicks, which is, which is our game that, you know, is, is currently still in development, you know, planned to release toward the end of this year. But then alongside that, as you, as you mentioned, our, our thesis was, you know, developing new games and developing new IP is, it's both challenging and, it, and it's risky. You know, it's not, it's not easy to do. And a lot of those games take, you know, three to four plus years to develop to have a really strong proposition. So, you know, what what we've done at Cathion is identified a number of sort of Web2 properties with existing user bases. You know, there's over of the games that we've signed up so far, and it's it's about 25 at the moment, and there's hundreds of hundreds of additional discussions in place. You know, there's over 50 million existing Web2 players across that across those gaming portfolios, and and it's a really wide and broad sort of portfolio of games across you know RPG games, anime games, you know shooters, you know puzzle games. You know, so there's a it's it's a really it's a really large spread, and you know our our theory here is that in taking games with existing fan bases that have had commercial success and have got existing fan bases. And then layering, you know, the benefits of Web3 gaming on top of that in terms of sort of integrating token economies and thinking about NFTs and thinking about how we do truly still keep entertainment front and center, but layer some of these earn mechanics or, or, you know, Web3 mechanics into it, then we can start creating bridges, you know, bringing players from Web2 into the Web3 ecosystem. You know, th- those couple of games you've mentioned are on Solana, but we are multi-chain. You know, we're thinking about this across across different chains based on the genre and based on what we think would be the best option for that game based on what it is. There's large anime communities on Ethereum, for instance. And, you know, if we've got a sport game, you know, we look at, at you know, Flow because of NBA Hot Shots might be a good option. You know, so we, we do think about, okay, well, what's the best, the, what's the best chain? And then... You know, alongside that, we have a platform for for discoverability. So, you know, thinking about a, a single place to you know see f- and find Web three games, and then have that as a marketplace for primary and secondary NFT transactions and stuff like that as well. So, it's still nine months young, and I'm relatively new to it, so I can't take too much credit for the work that's already been done by the team. But you know, Will and the team have made incredible inroads in a in a really short amount of time and there's an incredible future ahead that we're really excited about. I want to ask a question about geography and about kind of preferences for different types of experiences, for different types of form factors, as well as monetization models that you've seen both in your prior career as well as what you see in the blockchain gaming space. You know, so for example, the behavior patterns in Asia versus the West around, you know, free to play games or mobile games and not putting up with, but being familiar with the pay to win model, right? Playing for free, but then spending money within the game. And then of course the Axie experience, right? With Axie being very popular in the Philippines. It's a a pretty kind of unnatural degree. Can you take that lens geographically and maybe talk about the different behaviors that people have and kind of what implication you see in terms of Web3 adoption as well? There is differences, although of you are seeing, you know, like on in multiple fronts, you are seeing more a lot of sort of global convergence of tastes and trends. But a lot of the world's, particularly a lot of the world's video game trends have been born out of Asia. And so, you know, free to play mobile and even sort of mid core mobile gaming and a lot of those things. And I think we're seeing the same thing with Web3. You know, there's, there's a greater resistance to, to blockchain gaming in sort of the more traditional Western and, and European markets than there is to, to Asia. Not that it, not that that, you know, 
I, Asia is probably a, a little too, I'm being a little too specific, you know, even markets like LATAM as well, you know, are, are similar, but that's where you're seeing a lot of the trends and a lot of the pickup. On the pay to win piece, I don't really think it is, there's a greater acceptance of it in, in Asia, but even in Asia, it's not really that accepted. You know, a pure pay to win game will still be rejected like it would be in, in Western markets. So the monetization or, or of the different markets, you tend to find that, you know, in Asia, it's a little bit stronger in terms of average revenue per player. There's high disposable income in some markets like Japan and Korea, for instance. So, you know, they're more willing to kind of buy in-game items and things like that. But, you know, it's not massively dissimilar around the world. I think on your Axie Infinity example, it's an interesting one. I don't think that was a sustainable business model. And I think, you know, that play to earn business model that has the earn mechanic sitting right at the front, you could see what happened with Axie Infinity. You know, it pushed up the price of the token, it pushed up the price of the NFTs, and that basically crowds out any new user acquisition that comes into the market. And that basically breaks a game. That creates an unsustainable economy because any successful game has a circular or a virtual cycle in the economy whereby as players churn out, ideally you are being able to bring new user acquisition in. And when you have, you know, really high prices of entry that have been borne by inflationary pressure, then that's where the whole system, whole system breaks. What I find interesting about that model though, because some people say, hey, well, the gameplay's, you know, not not that exciting. But, you know, in, in some of the more emerging markets, you also have to keep in mind that, you know, and I think this is a nuance that also existed in my in my old role, that the technology is not the same. People don't necessarily have high spec computers or consoles or really high spec phones. So the idea of there being a proposition in emerging markets that's actually slightly more simplified gameplay, but that actually works for those audiences and builds audiences of players that enjoy actually do enjoy that experience and then can get some benefit of monetizing from that experience. I think that's probably why you've seen those games be successful in those markets. Not everybody's got high spec machines that can play high spec games. And you know, so I I think it'll be interesting to see the the way the space evolves. If all this stuff works. If we are in a world where there's lots of computational blockchains, where they're very performant and they can render the economic underpinnings of all these worlds and they can keep track of all the items and so on, assuming all that stuff works, which of course is a silly assumption to make without more caveats, but assuming that works, how do you see a player interact with games and virtual worlds how do you see you know nft objects travel in or between these worlds like what do you expect to happen to in game items paint a picture of the possible here you know if this comes to fruition because i think it's more than you know merely another monetization lever like what happens to avatars and identities if this stuff comes together yeah, I mean, there's so many ways that this could that this could play out. But let me let me sort of uh, you know hypothesize on it a little bit. I think the true interoperability. There's a long way to go. Like we, you know, the the idea that you can pick up a or you know acquire a sword and level it up in one game and then go and drop that down into into another game and have it. I think you know the balancing that occurs within in game economies and environments and maps is so delicate that that's going to be really tricky you over time it may end up being sold for and it might be something that you see you know between games of the one studio or games built on the same engine or if they're all built on unity there might be a way to solve around it but i think that's really that part of it's really really quite complex but i think if you if you think about this in terms of you know a couple of things so, you know the game could for, for an item in a game for instance could or earning in one game could perhaps create some type of benefit or level up in another game even if it's not the same the same item exactly you know there could be really strong collectability around the items in in a game you know i think i 
I forget where I read it, but I read, you know, someone drew the analogy of imagine if you could buy the NFT of the very weapon that your favorite esports athlete used to fire the shot in the Call of Duty World Championships to win the championship. And, you know, they signed the weapon and you had that weapon as an NFT. You know, that's got huge collectability and huge value that would be able to be used as an in-game item, but would also, regardless of what happened with Call of Duty, would have you know, it'd have utility outside that ecosystem as a true collectible item. And then I think what you'll see is, you know, companies start to get really clever about how they even potentially merge the real world with the with the virtual world. You know, if I if I draw an example of say, hey, imagine Fortnite as a game, you know, hugely popular, you know, people love the cosmetics in the game and building their characters up and all that kind of stuff. Imagine it was in a sort of play to earn mechanic and you had a sports brand, you know, like Nike, for instance, that created a super limited edition pair of sneakers, but then had an NFT that went with those sneakers. And let's just say that NFT gave you the same pair of sneakers in Fortnite. And so you could wear those shoes in, in, in Fortnite. You know, over time, that digital pair of sneakers has probably got infinite more value than the actual physical pair do, but you'll start to see some really interesting perhaps collaborations happen between the real world and the virtual world. I think there's multiple ways under which you could see this play out, and I don't think any of us really have the answers to that yet, but I think it's super exciting. It's going to be fun to, fun to work it out and see how it evolves. It's an absolutely fantastic space, and there are so many unanswered questions, which is, of course, what makes it interesting and promising. Mark, thank you so much for joining us today. If our audience wants to find out more about you, about Cathion, where should they go? Yeah, I mean, cathiongaming.com has has everything that you could, you know, you could find about the company. Otherwise, you know, you can look me up at LinkedIn. My Twitter's at Mark Orbs, Mark A-U-B-Z. So yeah, happy to happy to engage. But great to great to catch up, Lex. Thanks for taking the time. My pleasure. Thanks again. Thank you. Hi, everyone. That's it for this week's episode of the Fintech Blueprint. For more technical deep dives into all things fintech and decentralized finance, check out fintechblueprint.com and grab a free subscription to the newsletter. This is Lex, and I'll see you next time. <music>